Come on, side, 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 side. side. <laughs> What up all you internets out there, as my man Combat Jack would say, rest in peace as usual, y'all know what it says, this is at Lover, this is Come On Son, the podcast, as normal, like I said, just a minute, two seconds, rest in peace, Combat Jack, it wasn't even a whole minute ago I said that, and I'll say it again, rest in peace to Combat Jack, if this is your first time ever listening to my podcast, thank you for listening, checking me out, um, welcome trying to stay on top of things, trying to be consistent. Um, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm here another week to do this. And this was a funny week because I was like, yo, podcast is not easy. I've said this many times. Like, you got to always have stuff to talk about. And a lot of times I don't have people to bounce off. A lot of times it's just me. Um, sometimes I do it with, you know, with my producer Krista and I'll invite Jen BT in and Ange Marie, sometimes I have guests, um, sometimes I don't. Um, and when you don't, I think that's when, when you're not really uh, interviewing somebody. That's when it's the, the hardest time to podcast is when you, don't, when you don't really have somebody to interview. That's the hardest part because the time goes by a lot easier when you, you know, you're interviewing somebody, you're sitting there and you're talking to them. It makes the time your podcast go by faster. A lot of times I don't want to shortchange y'all with a podcast that's light in the ass and, you know, stupid, boring, just talking about regular shit. But that's cool too. But a lot of times I don't I don't like to do that. Um so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what I wanted to talk about. But first and foremost, I want to give another big giant shout out to Combat Jack. That's first of all, rest in peace. Second of all, I want to shout out to CigarsInternational.com, title sponsor for Come On, Son, the podcast. Um, I want to tell y'all to check out this uh, Connecticut Broadleaf cigar called the Charter Oak. It's a Grande 6x60 Nicaraguan smoke. Really good smoke, man. If y'all get an opportunity to check it out, it's called Charter Oak. Get the 6x60. Connecticut Broadleaf, Nicaraguan. Oh, oh, Connecticut, Nicaragua smokes are so good. Don't don't even fool yourself all the time thinking if you're a cigar smoker that it's, everything has to be all the time um, Cuban. That's not true at all. Check out the Charter Oak Cigar. You'll absolutely love it. It will amaze you. It's a great smoke, a good laid-back smoke, too. It's not, not super harsh. I ain't one of them super harsh smokers that like something that too spicy you got too much spice to it it's a really good smoke i really enjoyed that smoke so if you're smoking you're going to cigarsinternational.com you're like hey i want to check something out check out the charter oak grande 6x60 absolutely a good smoke now let's get into this uh podcast because i've already said what i need to say about the Great Combat Jack and about CigarsInternational.com. Go in there for all your cigar needs. Um, I want to talk about a lot of stuff that, you know, just happened. And um, stuff that happened last week. Last week was kind of interesting because Bill Cosby got locked up. He got sentenced to three to ten years. Um, and then, like, people just came out of the woodwork, and, and it was being discussed, and it was crazy, and then Amber Rose chimed in. Now, I'm not going to go in on Amber Rose. I'm not going to call the lady out of her name. Amber Rose is a human being like everybody else, and Amber Rose has her rights to her opinion. If you remember correctly, Amber Rose was made famous by Kanye West, who we'll talk about a little bit in a few because he just did something that was pretty incredible, in my opinion. Um, so Amber Rose went on to talk about um, Bill Cosby, and um, rightfully so, she's shaken by it and, and dismayed by it and disgusted by it. And she went on to say that she hopes that when he gets out of jail, he dies. Well, that evokes some emotion from black folks all over the Internet. 
And black people was like, like, come on, like, you wish he dies? Dies. Now, there's no one, I think there's no man out here, unless you're just a purely sadistic, rotten to the core type of person, that does not believe that women should have all the rights in the world. Now, I know there's a lot of men that don't, but those are the purely evil, sadistic ones I was talking about. And there's there's not a lot of men out here, Lord of Biden, citizens, good men, that don't think that if a man drugs and rapes a woman, that he should be in prison. I don't care who it is. Okay? But when we speak in what could be perceived as favor, of Bill Cosby, it's because we don't believe that the American justice system works for black people. We don't believe it. We don't believe that the American justice system is in our favor at any point, any time, and that there can always be a setup when it comes to black men. I don't want to be quick to judge anybody, and I don't think anybody else should be quick to judge anybody because we've seen too many instances and circumstances where we have been falsely accused of something as black people in America, and especially black men, and have gone to prison for it. And then it comes out years later, maybe 27, 28, 14, 15, 16 years, that the person... Is innocent. So when you when you hear somebody or you see somebody on the internet say something about Bill Cosby or about the setup of Bill Cosby, think about that with an open mind. Because this is difficult to say. Because if you, it's kind of like if you say you support Bill Cosby through his trials and tribulations, you're disrespecting women, and you really don't want to disrespect women because you do want to put your sisters your mothers, your aunties, your wives, your co-workers. You do, you do want to put them in a position where you let them know how much you love and care about them, and you want them to know that, you know, you would go to the end of the earth to protect them if something like this happened to them, and it doesn't really matter to you who the person was, who the perpetrator was. But then you sit back and you look at it and you go, Bill Cosby was a very powerful, influential man in this country, super influential, and he just got three to ten years for something that white people said he did. And that's when it really starts sticking to you and, and it starts bothering you that you understand how many times we've gone to trial for something that we didn't do and ended up in jail. I mean, Jay-Z and them just did a documentary about Khalif Browder, who, who ended up going to prison, getting jumped, ended up in a hole, and then he couldn't take it, and he, he killed himself. He was never supposed to be in jail in the first place. We can go all the way back, you know, to Scottsboro Boys. We can go all the way back to, you know, let's go all the way back to Emmett Till, who lost his life for something that he did not do, and then not a white woman who told the white boys that he whistled at them, I mean, whistled at her, finally recanted and said it never happened, and he lost his life behind it, which really sparked our civil rights movement. So I don't think it's so much, ladies, that we are taking a crack at you, that you don't have rights, that we don't believe anything that you say, or every time you yell rape, that is bullshit. That's, that's not what it is. I think for us, for black men, it's more of we don't believe in the American criminal justice system when it pertains to us, and we believe that this is a deliberate, deliberate way of washing away all the positives that Bill Cosby has given to us in society. This is a way to wash away his legacy, and it's being purposely done. That's what we believe, because we don't believe the criminal justice system, and it's a shame. We should, we're all Americans, we should be able to believe in the criminal justice system, but we've seen Eric Gardner, 
who I found out is a distant relative, a distant cousin of mine. We've seen him get choked and say, I can't breathe, and the cops be free off of it. We've seen Zimmerman. We know he shot and killed Trayvon Martin, and he's still running, walking around the streets making money. We've seen our president of the United States deflect responsibility when women came forward and said he sexually assaulted them, and he's sitting in the White House, and Bill Cosby's sitting in jail. I think the problem is we the difference between how black men are treated and how white men are treated and how white people are treated and how black people are treated in the criminal justice system. So, Amber Rose, we understand your anger. We understand that. But we're saying we understand it if Bill Cosby is 100% guilty and we don't put it past the American government to have set Bill Cosby up so they can erase his legacy. But to say that you wish that man would die it's kind of fucked up. It's it, it's really fucked up because we do pay attention to you, and I think the majority of us is still trying to figure out what your talent actually is when you're talking about a man who was supremely talented, like Bill Cosby, who made us proud to be black Americans way before we had Barack and Michelle when the Cosby Show was the number one show on television. And I had the opportunity to work with Mr. Cosby on The Cosby Show. It's not that we're belittling anything that women say or do. It's that we do not trust the American justice system when it comes to black people. We, j we just don't. It's, it's, it's systematic racism has been in place in this country for well over 400 years. And you could go back and, and look in the history of how many black men end up in prison compared to how many white men, how many black women compared to how many white women, how they're treated differently on the same charges. You're seeing that right now. Harvey Weinstein is still out. Woody Allen never went to jail. And I doubt if we'll ever see the day that Donald Trump goes to jail for the things that he's perpetrated against women. He's on record saying he grabbed him by the pussy. So whenever you hear a black man say they think Bill Cosby is innocent, it's not because we belittle and use, because we don't believe in the justice system. We don't believe it. We we know, we, come on, they, we know damn well they killed Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. We know damn well they killed off the black Panthers. We saw the documents. The documents have come to light. Cointel Pro, how it was designed to get inside these organizations and make them look criminal and then assassinate or kill off their leadership. Bill Cosby wasn't a leader of black people. This, this doesn't, this totally diminishes all the good that the man has done. All the good. Making black people proud so that we started enrolling in HBCUs like crazy when a different world was on. A lot of black people that graduated college went to college because of a different world. First black doctor and, and, and lawyer married couple on TV. You haven't even seen that role portrayed again yet. Now when you watch TV and you see a sitcom, you may see one token black person out of a whole cast of people. The same blatant racism is thrown in your face all the time, and then you support it. So that's why you'll hear somebody say they don't believe Bill Cosby is guilty. That's why. Because after all of these years, all of this stuff is brought up. All of the stories from the one young lady that came forward and said there were some lawyers that asked her to come to the office that was willing to pay her over a million dollars to step up and say Bill Cosby did something to her. It's to it's not to diminish what happened to any woman, but it is a strike against a black man and a supremely popular black man who was trying to buy a major network. And then all of a sudden his son dies and his daughter dies and now he's in jail. And we're supposed to believe just because the American justice system and American public says that he's guilty, we're supposed to believe that? Yeah, and Lee Harvey Oswald shot 
to kill John F. Kennedy by himself with a single bolt action rifle, right? Okay. Yeah. So please don't take this the wrong way. And like I said, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna call Amber Rose all kind of half whatever people was calling her. I'm not I'm not gonna do that. And the reason I'm not gonna do that is based on my man Wiz Khalifa, who I enjoy his music and I'm cool with the brother when I see him and he has a child with that woman. So I'm not gonna go into all of her faults and be disrespectful, but I will I just wanted to explain that to women who may listen and say, well, why do, why God saying that? Why they don't believe us? Why every time we say somebody did something to us, we have to be a gold digger and lie, you know, a gold digger and a liar and a hoe and all of that. With this case, that ain't what it's about. With this case with Mr. Bill Cosby, it's about our disbelief in the American justice system when it comes to people of color. I should have clarified that a little bit earlier when it comes to people of color any color serious 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 shit man because you you look at this country right now and all of those children that were separated from their families at the mexican border they haven't been put back with their families yet kind of like what kind of shit is that so so now we all pumped up that we mad at every mexican don't make no sense. That don't make a bit of sense. So I was checking that out this week, and then Indonesia had a tsunami. A lot of people lost their lives. May God protect everybody around this globe, man. That is so, so sad to see all of those people lose their lives in that tsunami in Indonesia. I was checking that out this week. Um, Shit, Sunday just passed. It's Monday, and uh, my damn team lost again. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am a New York Giants fan. Have been for a long time. Just actually just bought another New York Giants shirt and a winter hat because I'm in Chicago now, and I knew I was going to need a, a hat. And I was like, damn, where, where's all my Giants? I'm going to have to go back to Atlanta and dig through a bunch of boxes to try to find my Giants hat. And then... um. I went to fanatics.com and got me another Giants hat. It's tough. I feel for people, man. Like, people like, if you listen to this and you're in Cleveland and you're a Cleveland Browns fan and y'all never won a championship, I feel for you. I, I really feel for anybody that got a team out there that's just been in a downward spiral the way my team has. We got rid of Tom Coughlin. Got rid of Tom Coughlin. Tom Coughlin was our head coach when we won our two Super Bowls, right, in uh, the last two Super Bowls, right, when Eli Manning, under Eli Manning. Y'all remember that, the catch with David Tyree. Then we beat uh, the Patriots, right, we beat the Patriots twice in the Super Bowl. Um, Tom Coughlin was our head coach. The, the, all kind of stuff was going around that he lost this, he lost that, he he didn't do this right, he didn't do that right. They, they weren't listening to him anyway. Anymore, so they got rid of him, and he went to the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he's in the front office, and they look fucking good, really good. Stick with your team, man. I mean, I know it's hard, and I take a lot of flack for it. I take, especially here in Chicago, this is Bears territory. It ain't no two ways about that. And the Bears look great with Khalil Mack. What, a, what an acquisition. They look fantastic. They look great this Sunday just passed. They certainly stomped the shit out of Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But stay with your team. Raiders fans out there, stay stay with your team. Stay. I know it's, I know it looks like it's, it's tough. Falcons, y'all not looking good either. Stay with your team, though. Stay with your team. For those people who are watching football, I know there's a lot of African-Americans that are still mad at the Colin Kaepernick thing that he's being blackballed from playing football, but Cap ain't even trying to play football no more. He's he's on something else. Like if Cap was stood up and said, "Listen, oh everybody don't watch football no more," I might be more inclined to join this boycott of the National Football League. You know, but he didn't. So I'm watching my team, and I hope everybody that got a team that's losing. I hope. You guys are sticking with your team. 
Don't be a fair weather fan. Be an all weather fan. I mean, like, if that's your squad, that's your squad. Let me tell y'all something, man. So I'm going to get a little personal about myself real quick. About, you know, since I'm reviewing stuff that I saw this week that just passed. I don't, I don't, I don't like when you a fair weather fan. Just if you a fan, be a fan. I got the Giants. These are my favorite teams: the Giants, the Yankees, and the New York Knicks. I'm not gonna, and I now don't, don't get me wrong. I enjoy Golden State Warriors basketball. I think LeBron James is fan freaking tastic. Oh, I think LeBron James, man. I think LeBron is like nothing we've ever ever seen before. I enjoy the debates in the barber shop and could LeBron play back in the days with Jordan and all of them when the game was much tougher and they weren't calling all these little pity patty girl calls when actually they would fight on the court, you know, back in the Barkley days and the Ewan days and all of that. LeBron is a huge dude. I think because of the way the game was, and that's all that he knew, he would adapt it quite nicely and still been a superstar in the league. I, thir- I thoroughly believe that. And that's barbershop arguments. I love barbershop arguments, right? The Jay-Z and Nas beef is always still going to be barbershop argument, argument. Who's my top five of all time? It's going to be a barbershop argument. And I'll get to that in a minute, right? But... I'm not, if I'm a Cleveland Cavalier fan, I'm not now a Lakers fan. You understand what I'm saying? Because LeBron just went to the Lakers, he left. If I'm a Cleveland Cavalier fan, that's what I am. No matter who is on the team, no matter how many times we went to championship, because LeBron left does not make me any less a fan of the Cleveland Cavaliers if that was my team. I am a New York Knickerbocker fan. I have been through it all, ladies and gentlemen. I've been through it. We haven't won a championship since 1973. It's 2018. You do the math. 1973. Do y'all know how old I was in 1973, the last time the Knicks won? 10. I'm 55. I've been through it. All all the Ewan years, when we was almost there, when we... Almost won. When, when we played the Houston Rockets and the Houston Rockets won with Olajuwon and Kenny the Jet Smith and Sam Cassell and all of them, I was a fan then. When Michael Jordan used to destroy us year after year, no matter how close we got, I was a fan then. When Reggie Miller dropped the, like almost 10 points in 22-something seconds, I don't remember. I got to watch the 30 for 30 again. I was a fan then. I don't care. I'm not rooting Seriously, I will enjoy it. And if you say, hey, Ed, who you think is going to win, I will tell you who I think is going to win. But I don't have a pony in that race until it's the New York Knicks. And I've been suffering for a long time. I'm an all-weather fan, not a fair-weather fan. Okay? If LeBron leaves the Lakers and comes to the Knicks, I'm still a Knicks fan. If LeBron wins three championships with the Knicks, I'm a Knicks fan. But when LeBron leaves, I'm not following him. I'm with my team. I can't stand that. You were a Cleveland Cavalier fan yesterday. Now you're a Lakers fan because LeBron went to the Lakers. That's some bullshit. You can be a fan of the individual player. You can be a player. You can be a fan of LeBron. I'm a fan of LeBron. Oh, I'm a fan of LeBron. Okay? I am, but I'm a fan of a team first. A team. Why do we only do that in basketball? Nobody. I've never seen anybody do that in football. Now all of a sudden you're going to change. you from Cleveland, born and raised. LeBron comes. He's the Messiah. He leaves. You disrespect him. He goes to Miami and wins. Then he decides to come back. One of the greatest moves I've ever seen after the way the owner talked about him anyway. Brings back a championship and runs like, it ain't like Cleveland didn't have runs to the championship. Brings a championship back and a lot of runs to the finals. That's your squad. You get to hoist that trophy up. LeBron did it. Opened the school up and all of that. It's all good to be a LeBron fan. But if you were a Cleveland fan before they got LeBron, 
then you should still be a Cleveland fan. You shouldn't jump to the fucking Lakers because he plays for the Lakers now. It's still okay to say, you know what? I'm rolling with LeBron. I like the way the dude play. All of that. But if you are a fan of the Cleveland Cavaliers, then you should still be. Now, if you only wore that jersey because LeBron was on the squad, then you are a LeBron fan. You're not the team fan. I am a New York Knickerbocker fan, and we suck monkey ass. We got Porzingis. He's out for the season. We ain't going to be shit this year. And I'm going to still wear my New York Knicks hat proudly, and I'm going to still pop shit. I don't care if we only win three days. Three games, excuse me. Or in three days. I don't care either one. But find out and figure the fuck out what you are. Because I don't like fair weather fans. I like all weather fans. Rock with your team no matter what. Rock with your team, B. Stop being like that. You're going to jump now. You're a Lakers fan. Get the fuck out of here. You're a LeBron fan. You ain't a Lakers fan. You're a LeBron fan. Now you rocking Lakers. You can still support LeBron without rocking the Lakers if you come from Cleveland. You've been a Cleveland Cavalier fan your whole life. Now, come on, B. Come on, B. Don't do that, y'all. Don't do that. Now, if you're just a LeBron fan and you don't even care about basketball like that, you're not invested into any particular team, then by all means, go ahead. Wear your Lakers jersey. Still bring out your Miami Heat LeBron James jersey. Collect all the jerseys LeBron ever wore. That's fine. But if you're a Cleveland fan, don't all of a sudden jump ship and be a Lakers fan. Suffer like the rest of us, all right? Y'all had a lot of years of suffering. Suffer, the Browns still making y'all suffer. Y'all got some light now, though. But suffer like everybody else. Roll with your squad. Okay? Now, here's something else I found interesting this past week. Little Wayne just dropped the Carter Five. Is it worth the listen in Ed Lover's opinion? I think Little Wayne has always been worth the listen. Even when he was doing stuff that I didn't understand. I always thought Little Wayne was worth the listen. A um, lot of records on there I, I enjoy. A lot of records I don't. Um, what, where would I place that album on a 1 to 10 scale? Probably give Wayne a... It ain't the Carter Four. Now, that album was amazing. I thought, I don't, I don't really feel like Wayne broke any new ground, even with the Swiss Beats produced song that samples Let's Get It by G-Dap. It wasn't, to me, I liked the song, but it wasn't to me like, you know, musically Wayne went any there, any, Wayne went any place that I didn't expect him to go. I didn't expect that 90 sample, but I don't think Swiss did enough with it, in my opinion, for me to go, oh my God, what a unique way to sample, you know, let's get it from G, from G Depp. So I would say give it a listen because Wayne is one of those artists that has managed to survive for a long time and managed to be on our radar for such a long, long, long time that when he puts a project out, I give it a listen. Um, it's something to being able to do what he's been doing for as long as he's been doing it and he's been doing it from 16 from different generations and still managed to be super relevant when it comes to hip hop so all kudos to Lil Wayne that's my man it's always love always love man I got so much love and respect for that dude man that dude took care of my wife one night and lived it was it was really astonishing the way he did that and I got the utmost respect for him like they were supposed to move out of his section. It was his section. He told them all to stay, her and all her girlfriends. He took care of everything. Um, and she wanted a picture with him, and she told him that she was my wife. And he was like, yo, I love Ed. Ed is my man. Like, big love to Lil Wayne for that, man. But definitely check out. Check it out. Check the album out for yourself. Check the album out for yourself. I don't, I don't base my opinion on people's music on my personal relationships or personal encounters with people. I'm not going to hate your album because you and I had a bad encounter. In the case of Wayne, we've never had a bad encounter. And I'm not basing the fact that I think his album is good on the fact that that's my dude. Like, I like Wayne a lot. 
that this was what I found was interesting. So I was on Twitter, the day Wayne's, not Twitter, I was on the gram, excuse me, the day Wayne's album came out, and people were just tweeting about it, Little Wayne's album, Little Wayne's album, Little Wayne's album, and, and Meek Mill posted, Wayne's album is out, make sure y'all check it out, the Carter Five, Wayne has always been top three of all time. He didn't say all time. He said times, which was grammatically incorrect. Top three of all time in my book. So, of course, I go in the comment section, and I'm probably sure Meek didn't see this, and I got a lot of respect for Meek, too, to what he's doing since he's been out of prison or jail. Um, and I wrote, I just want to know what's the criteria because that's something that I have been trying to figure out for the longest. And as I get older, some and someone asked me the same question that people have asked me for the last 30 years, Ed, who's your top five? I have to ask that question, what's the criteria? And of course, I know Meek didn't see it, so he didn't, he didn't answer it. You know, I just put, because I didn't want him, I wasn't challenging him, I just wanted to know What's the criteria for somebody to be in your top five or your top three? What is the criteria? So, like, or is it just personal? I like him. I think he's top three of all time. Because I think when we've been talking about this for so long, like, what is the criteria for somebody to be considered the top five of all time? Is it? volume of music that they put out is it are they hot they still hot is it their voice is it their rhymes is it sales the album sales or record sales and music sales is it longevity like what is it what is it their impact on pop culture what is it? Is it their impact on their era's pop culture? Because I don't know if you say, is it all right? Or is it they were groundbreaking game changers? Were they game changer? How did they affect pop culture? Were they a game changer? Because you may look and say, okay, such and such a did this, that, and the third. Wayne did this. Wayne's had dope ass mixtapes. Wayne's had dope ass albums. Wayne was part of the Hot Boys. That was dope. Wayne had a clothing line that all the kids gravitated to. Truck fit. That was dope. Wayne got into the skateboard thing. He made the skateboard thing cool. That was dope. He definitely had an effect with the dreadlocks and the tattoos on all the other artists that came behind him. I mean, he's you know he's been dope. He's done dope records with Babyface and he the Millie was dope. That whole album was dope which was a Magnus Opus album for Wayne. That was that. That was dope. But is it that effect on the culture at the time that Wayne came out? Or, you know, other people have done that before. Whether Did it change the whole scope? Did it shift the musical scope or the musical landscape? Because really, honestly, I mean, Jay-Z has done that. Two, and so is Puff. Cultural phenomenons. Those guys during their time, LL Cool J, absolutely. During his time, Rakim, absolutely. During his time, so, like, what's the criteria? And I just this this question just, I just wish that we could figure this out because it's always. If you, when you start naming people, you're always, if you go down to five people, five rap artists, you're always going to leave somebody off and you're going to be like sitting there scratching your head like, how the hell could I not put that person on the list? Like if he has Wayne in his top three of all time, there's somebody who is great, who was may not be musically relevant now, but was a shifter before he was born 
is going to get left off. And when you say greatest of all time, then you have to consider everyone who's ever done it. Everybody. Even if they did it before you were alive. Even if it happened before I was alive. You have to consider each and every person. So I think for us to truly, respectfully answer that question, we have to set a criteria. Now, when you're talking greatest of all time, are you talking can they be a part of a group? Or do it have to be a solo MC? Because usually people, I always hear Biggie, Biggie J and Nas, I always hear from everybody. I always hear that. But do you discount the impact of Andre 3000 because he's in a group with Big Boy? Do you discount Run from Run DMC because he was part of Run and D and J? Where does Rakim fit in there? Where does LL fit in there? Where does, if you, even if you think it's Wayne, if, where does Wayne fit in there? Where does Big, you know, I mean, I said Big. Where does Kane, Big Daddy Kane, where does Karis one fit in there? If you're going by sales, Outkast sold 10 million albums, but so did Vanilla Ice and Hammer. So do you put them in your top? Because of their sales? Where does DMX fit in there? Where does Ja Rule, who sold a lot of fucking records, where does he fit in there? Like, it's what's the criteria? Where does Kumo D fit in there? Where does Grandmaster Cass fit in there? Where does Melly Mel fit in there? Who is probably one of the most important rap artists of all time because that message really changed hip hop forever and so did Rakim Allah <laughs> so where do they fit in there do you take away points off of Biggie and Pac because they didn't live long enough and a lot of that stuff was put out posthumously I mean there's a lot of stuff that they did but they didn't sit down and collaborate with the producers to come up with it for whoever had a battle that you think won or lost the battle do you take away points for that like it's it's tough it is tough. Where does Kanye West fit in tonight? A lot of people would say Kanye West belongs on somebody's top 10 list. A lot of people would disagree. Do you discount Kanye? You can say Kanye had an effect on pop culture and is continuing to have an effect on pop culture, whether you agree with him or not. But we'll get to him in a minute. But where does he go on your greatest of all time list? I just wish we can figure out a criteria because I don't like to say it. And when people ask me about it, I say there is no such thing. I said for every era, there was a top five or maybe a top 10. Even if you ended up in the top 10, to me, you just amazing. I think it just, you, you go by errors. Do you discount the impact Ludacris has had on hip hop? Do you select members of the Wu? Do you discount Ray and Ghost and their impact? Do you discount the RZA's impact on hip hop and television and film? Do you discount how important Inspector Dex setting off the rhyme for a lot of those songs, being the first one to order or to come out the gate or the second one on Cream? Do they have to have a magnum opus album or do they have to have a certain amount of record sales? What is the criteria to be considered the greatest of all time? And that's what I really wanted to know. Or is it just personal? Or is this my top five rappers that I've enjoyed the most in my lifetime during my era with the years that I was alive? I, that's why I don't like when magazines do it because I think People get left out that deserve to be there. Where do you place Drake? That's interesting. Is, is, is Drake above? He's a bigger star than Wayne ever was. This dude Canadian. Where do you place him? Cultural impact is crazy. Sales is crazy. So far, the longevity is there. I mean, he ain't got the longevity of Jay-Z, but so far, the longevity is there. 
It's been almost 10 years. Has he had a magnus opus of an album? Some people would say so. Or is he just one of those people that has a collection of great singles? Who's always be able to find that hit? Like Fat Joe. I can't point to one album of Fat Joe's and say that was Fat Joe's greatest album. But Fat Joe has had a body of work that is amazing. It's just he always finds a hit record. Always. So where do we place them? What about the people that could just rap? Their ass is off like most deaf and Talib and Farrell Monch, Q tip from a tribe called Quest. Where do we where do we place these guys at? Royce the five nine. Pusha T. Where do we where do we place the guy? Lupe Fiasco. Where do we place these guys at? All right, maybe culturally a lot of these guys didn't have that kind of an impact where you went out and bought clothes or goods and services because of them. But what about Eminem? Where do we place Eminem? So what's the criteria? I always think that you have to break it down into errors and say, these were the best people of that, of this era. Because if you look at it right now, say you say, okay, I'm putting Drake in my top five. My argument would be LL was Drake before Drake. So what's Drake doing now? LL did 80s and in the, in the 90s. The way Drake and the Migos can go on a concert tour and they can do an arena, LL was doing stadiums. Not arenas, stadiums. Run DMC was the first hip-hop artist like that to actually was, was headlining stadium tours. Now, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five went out, but they were open for Cameo. They would be on the same ticket with Cameo and the Barcades and stuff like that. It was always a big package. Running them came. It was headlining stadium tours. So was LL Cool J. Drake Arenas, stadium. You see how we had to go to Soldier Field here in Chicago, or you had to go to some MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, or some other stadium to see the On the Run 2 tour with Beyonce and Jay-Z. Drake and Amigos was on an arena tour. It's a lot less seats in an arena than there is a stadium or even compared to seeing 50 Cent lately at Ravina, Rav, excuse me, Ravinia here in Chicago, which is like an amphitheater with grass and stuff like that. You can bring your own food and stuff like that. But when Fifth goes overseas, it's a whole different story. I believe the last time Kanye West came through, he was doing arenas also. Run and LL and them did stadiums it's a difference folks when well, you're headlining a stadium tour so back to my question somebody please hit me up at ed lover you can even dm me on instagram hit me on twitter at mr ed lover tell me lay it out all you hip-hop fanatics lay it out what is the criteria to be considered the greatest of all time, or is it just your personals? Or would you rather just somebody tell you their personals? Because people always say, yo, I respect you, you know, as one of the OGs of hip hop. You know, I'm not a triple OG like, you know, Mo D and them. You know, I didn't come around professionally till 1989. Mo D and them, Kaz and them was around in the 70s. I, I, I wasn't on the map, I was a hip hop fan but I wasn't on the map as somebody that, that people know. Even though I had my own little, thought I was going to, you know, rhyming and stuff, calling myself MC Eddie D at that time, which is funny because the only person that calls me Eddie D is Chuck D from Public Enemy. I don't know why <laughs> he still remembers me as Eddie D. But those guys were around, so those are the real OGs in the, in the real, when hip-hop was really first starting to grow before it became rap when it was hip hop, the culture of hip hop music. Those guys were around, so I believe they should have a voice in what's the criteria for being the greatest of all time. And who makes, you know, who hits every mark of that criteria? 
I mean, KRS One hasn't had a hit record out in years. Do you leave KRS One as dope as he was off your list? Do you leave Slick Rick the Ruler, one of the most influential MCs of all time? Do you leave him off? Where do you place Snoop? Where do you place Ice Cube? Where do you where do you place Scarface? Where do you put Bun B? Where do you, do you where do you put Pimp C? These are all people who have touched the mic. Devin the Dude, Dr. Dre, Easy E, Tupac. Where do you where do you place these people? It's been some dope MCs out there. My hieroglyphics crew from the Bay. Where do you where do you place them dudes at? Too short. Successful as fuck. E40. Successful as fuck. Where do you place them at when you start talking greatest of all time? Please hit me up, y'all, and tell me how we can finally solve who belongs, what the criteria is for greatest of all time. Hit me up, man. At Ed Lover on the gram, DM me. Mr. Ed Lover on Twitter. Hit me up, man, because I really, really would like to know your opinions on what the criteria should be to be considered greatest of all time. Like I said, Kanye West, a lot of people would put Kanye West on that list, even though you don't agree with everything he says all the time. Now, y'all remember a little while ago, Kanye was on TMZ, and he had his opinion on certain things, and mostly being free to feel the way you want to feel and not having people pressure you because you feel that way. We know Kanye West is a Trump supporter. Therefore, me not being a Trump supporter and not thinking that Donald Trump really even cares about black people, I cannot support Kanye West right now. And then people say, oh, Ed, he was, you know, he came, he came clean. He apologized for saying slavery is a choice. He said he was in a sunken place. He was on opioids. He had an opioid addiction. He had to get himself cleaned up. And I am a forgiving human being because I would want somebody to forgive me. But I need Kanye to know how damaging that is because he does have such a resounding and powerful voice in music that I think when you talk about your own people, you have to be very careful. Well, Mr. West has done it again, ladies and gentlemen. This week, this week, Kanye West, all right, tweeted a picture of a Make America Great Again hat. And he said in his tweet, this represents good and America becoming whole again. We will no longer outsource to other countries. We build factories here in America and create jobs. We will provide jobs for all who are free from prisons as we abolish the 13th Amendment. The message sent with love. And of course, people jumped on him. All right? Somebody tweeted, Renee Not tweeted, Renee Not Sports. And he's verified. So Kanye West wants to abolish the 13th Amendment. It declared that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So you want to get rid of the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. Then Kanye went on to say he wanted to amend he meant amend and not totally abolish. Okay, he said he meant amend more than abolish. But in the initial tweet, he said, as we abolish the 13th Amendment, message sent with love. And then somebody else pointed out that when Kanye sent that picture in that tweet, he sent that picture of a make America Great Again hat. Now, he said this stuff, and then he alluded to it again when he did his performance on Saturday Night Live, right? That Kanye 
okay, sent that message out from a private jet, okay, flossing in the back of it with Yeezys on that were made in China. So the clothes that you sell to everybody that loves you and follows you, you talking about make America great again, those clothes are not even made in America. They're made in China and imported. Okay, we're not going to outsource jobs. Well, all the clothes that you make come from outsourcing of jobs. You see that? He said this from a private jet while wearing a Trump hat and decked out in Yeezy, made in China. That's a lot of confusion. And I agree with Marlo Stern, Marlo, at Marlo NYC. Ben Philippe at Go Home Ben tweeted back to Kanye, you would love books, dude. They're like millions of hat slogans stacked together. They would blow your face. Baldwin, Dubois, Angelou, Michelle, Alexander, this is such a waste of platform and black thinker that genuinely seems to want to get at something. And I agree. Kanye, your, your voice is super powerful. Super powerful. You have to be careful. Got to be careful. Oh, he went on to say, the 13th Amendment is slavery in disguise, meaning it never ended. We are the solution that heals. Then he went on to say, not abolish, but let's amend the 13th Amendment. We apply everyone's opinions to our platform. I just... Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, but my thing is, I understand where he's coming from. This is the part that, that I, I understand. Slavery, indentured servitude are legal punishments for crime. So what he basically wants to is get rid of that part of the 13th Amendment. Now, if that's what your intentions were, before you talked, before you said anything, you should have really read what the 13th Amendment was. It's obvious you did not read what the 13th Amendment was all about. Okay? But we have to dig. People are not that smart. Everybody is not going to dig to understand and read the 13th Amendment to try to specify particularly what part that what you meant when you said abolish the 13th Amendment. All I saw is you said want to abolish the 13th Amendment, all right? That, that you didn't spe specifically say amend the 13th Amendment to disclude this part. That would have been a lot smarter. And it's dangerous when you, when, you, when you say shit like that, wearing a fucking Trump hat, wearing Yeezys that are made in China. And see, every time I get ready where I'm getting right here, where I'm like, okay, I dig where the brother's coming from. And I do. We should all be free thinkers. We should all be able to... to Agree to disagree. Like, I'm not a Trump supporter. He is. That's your business. But if you're down with that devil, then I'm not down with you. That's just me. But that's me being a free thinker. And he's allowed to say, I like Trump. I think Trump is right for this country. And I'm allowed to say when it blows up in his face, see, I told you so. But when you have a platform and a voice as powerful as Kanye West is, you have to be very careful with what you say. You gotta be. You gotta be careful, dude. You, you, you gotta be. I, I tried to forgive you for the slavery was a choice joint. Now you want to abolish the amendment that abolished slavery. Then you came back and said, no, I meant the men, only this part. Then why didn't you say that? Duke. Come on, Duke. Seriously? Should have been A1 with that from day one, homie. Yeah, you make it hard. You make it, you know how you got that one cousin that make it hard to love him. 
That's how I feel like about Kanye West sometimes. Like, dude, you you make it hard for us. You make it hard for us, especially clear thinking Americans. I got to read somebody else tweet to tell me what you meant in your tweet. I'm like, come on. Do you even know what you meant when you tweeted it? It's that one cousin, man. As soon as you just, yeah, all right, he fucked up, but we love him. We're going we gonna to take him back. And then he fuck up again. Excuse me, y'all, I'm throwing something away. He take him back again. Then he fuck up again. Then he make an excuse for his fucking, ah, oh, I was high. I'm sorry I did that that time, man. I, You know, I crashed your car. I was high, man. Please, uh, I was high, man. I was in a, a sunken place, man. Don't talk about my wife. Don't talk about what my wife did. Don't. Don't say you fucked my wife, even if you did, even if that's how she got on. We're going to bring factories back and the work jobs back to America. That's what we're going to do. But I'm still going to pump my Wheezies out of the factory in China. Because we going to do, because we got to make America great while I'm on my private jet, making sure that my Yeezys come out. But no Americans has got jobs Making your Yeezys because your Yeezy factory is in China. Ah. Weird stuff. Weird, 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 weird stuff. I tell you. I tell you. Things like that just make me go, I did damn. Damn. Then I hear great stuff like the Wu-Tang Clan is on tour during it. Whole Into the 36 Chambers album. The whole album. Now, when they came here to Chicago, I didn't get an opportunity to see the Wu-Tang Clan perform. And then I found out after the fact that they was doing a whole goddamn Into the 36 Chambers album. That album means a lot to me. That was the album that I used to listen to on a daily basis. And when I used to drive them to work from New York, I used to have to go from New Jersey to New York, and I used to take this tunnel called the Lincoln Tunnel every day. And when I got to the mouth of the Lincoln Tunnel, right before I went into the tunnel, I would pop in my Into the Wu-Tang Clan 36 Chambers CD on my way to Hot 97 in New York in the morning where I was doing mornings, and I would play Shame on the nigga to get myself pumped up. That album is a whole fucking lot to me. So I am absolutely going to be October 6th in Atlanta to see the Wu-Tang Clan perform the entire Into the 36 Chambers. Now, will it be the same? No. You know why? Because Old Dirty Bastard is no longer with us. May his soul rest in eternal peace. But I still want to see the rest of the Wu-Tang Clan, the surviving members of the Wu, do that entire damn album. Yes, I do. I will be right there. That is one of my favorite albums of all time. It is absolutely their magnum, magnus opus. It's their first LP. It's what introduced me to all the members of the Wu-Tang. Yes, this is before Capadonna. And I love Cap. This is the one. This is the raw, I give it to you with no trivia. We're like cocaine straight from Bolivia. That was you, God, for all of y'all who tried to downplay you, God's importance in the woo. Think about how important that line was to set that song off. Hmm? Raw, I'm going to give it to you with no trivia. We're like cocaine straight from Bolivia. My hip hop will rock and shock the nation like the Emancipation Proclamation. Come on. I know we all love meth and Ray and Ghost and Rizza and Jizza, Old Dirty, Master Killer, Inspect Deck, You God, Ghost and, 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 and Meth. We, we love them all. But don't downplay the You God's contribution to the rule. All right? Don't downplay Inspect the Deck. Inspect the Deck. If you God didn't have one of them albums like Meth had that went out, everybody went and ran and got it. He didn't have a purple tape album, you know, he have a supreme clientele like Ghostface, but he is an important cog in the Wu-Tang. He's an important spoke in the wheel of the Wu-Tang Clan. Because if you take that verse off of that record, it's not the same record. It's not the same record. 
It's like hut one, hut two, hut three, hut. Old dirty bastard, live and uncut. Styles unbreakable, shatterproof. To the young youth, you want to get gun? Shoot, important shit. That's shit that you, re that you remember. First time I ever met the Wu-Tang Clan, Jones Beach in New York. Greek festival out there I used to have every year. All of us used to go. These nine to 10 to 12 motherfucking people surrounded me and said, yo, we the Wu-Tang Clan, we from Staten Island, and handed me a tape. What's up, Ed Lover? Well, I wasn't going to deny the tape. I mean, it was dusty looking, and they had on Tim's on the beach. And I remember I looked at the Jizza. I looked at the Rizza, actually, first. And I said, I know you. Your name is Raheem. You're a rapper. We play your videos on your own TV raps. I love you, Raheem. He's the Rizza now. He's the Rizza. The motherfucking Rizza. It's okay if you call yourself the Rizza. I don't know what the fuck that's about. But I remember they handed me a white tape, promo tape. Protect your neck on one side and a method man on the other side. M-E-T-H-O-D, man. And I thought it was weird that this method man dude would have a solo record on a group album. Then I understood the genius of the rhythm. And I also recognized the jizzle. Because he had a record out with a video we used to play. It. I can't remember the name of it right now. But we used to play it on your own TV raps. And I didn't know that they all got together and formed this fucking super group of dope MCs that would change hip-hop in a way groups are even signed forever. I salute you, Wu-Tang Clan. One of my favorite groups of all time. And we can go do a top five favorite groups of all time. But what's the criteria for that? Right? I'm Ed Lover, man. This has been Come On, Son, the podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. These are just my opinions. You don't have to agree with everything that I say. And I'm quite sure that you don't. But I do thank you for listening and keeping this podcast going and, and, and allowing me to get my thoughts out and my feelings. Once again, thank you to CigarsInternational.com. Thank you to Krista for producing this joint the way she does. She's an amazing person. Thank you to everybody for checking me out. Rest in peace, Combat Jack. This is Come On, Son, the podcast. I'm Ed Lover, and I approve this message. Now get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. This Ed Lover podcast is being done in conjunction with Cigars International. Make sure you check out CigarsInternational.com for all your cigar needs. This episode of Come On, Son, the podcast is produced and engineered by co-executive producers Kimana Paulus and Krista Hayes. Recorded at Mean Street Studios in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, this is an official Loudspeakers Network podcast. This network podcast. This network podcast. This network podcast.